Hey there, I'm Jeff Kopp, founder of Learning Revolution, and thanks for joining me for this talk on e-learning in 2021 and beyond. What will it take to succeed? Now, as I was in the process of putting this talk together, we were coming up on roughly a year of wrestling with a global pandemic. And as I'm sure you noticed, during that time, everything seemed to move online. And that certainly included education of all varieties and one of the side effects was that the market for online courses got a whole lot more crowded and a whole lot more competitive. And so sitting here in the first part of 2021, you may be wondering, is it even still worth building an online course and what's it going to take to actually succeed? Now, the short answer to those questions uh, are yes, it is still worth it, but clearly things have changed and it's gonna take a different approach to succeed. And that's exactly what we're going to take a look at together. How is the e-learning landscape evolving and what's it going to take to succeed in 2021 and beyond? And I've boiled this down to seven points. Now the first is the most obvious in many ways, but that may also make it the most important and that's elevated expectations. Expectations are elevated when it comes to e-learning. A lot of people who had zero experience with online learning before the spring of 2020 now have quite a bit of experience. And those who are already seasoned e-learners are now old pros. At the same time, uh, a lot of really smart experts who hadn't yet ventured into online education were pretty much forced to in 2020. So they came into the market. And that means that pretty much anybody out to enroll in an online course these days has higher expectations for it than they did a year ago. Sometimes much higher expectations, especially if they're being asked to pay for it. So what's that mean for you as an entrepreneur? Well, for one thing, it means higher production values uh, are going to count much more than they did in the past. Just sticking a video camera in, in front of you and bad lighting or narrating over some PowerPoints is much less likely to cut it than it was just a couple of years ago. Along those same lines, it means increased interactivity. People uh, aren't just Zoom fatigued, they're digitally fatigued. And if you don't give them opportunities to interact with your content, with you, and ideally with other learners in meaningful ways, you're gonna lose them. And then finally, all of this means better design overall. You can have high production values and lots of interactivity, but if there's really no design leading to tangible, meaningful learning outcomes, then you won't be delivering the kind of value that keeps learners coming back. Now, fortunately, implementing better design isn't rocket science, but because so few course creators do it, just a little bit of effort can really help differentiate you in the market. We can't cover all the ins and outs of good learning design in a, in a brief session like this. We're just kind of focused on trends here, but I've put together a few resources that will help you with designing better learning experiences. And you can find those and other resources that go with this talk at learningrevolution.net slash learnworlds slash resources. Now my next point is related to the point I just made about higher expectations and design but it also has to do with delivery. And the point is that blended is better. And by that, I mean that getting good at blending different types of content and experiences is another way to, to really stand out and succeed. And that applies especially to blending online learning with face-to-face -face learning, something we haven't heard so much about lately. But one of the biggest opportunities by late 2021 is going to be a return to face-to-face -face learning experiences, experiences that happen in a physical classroom as people get comfortable with gathering in person again. And people are gonna be really hungry for it. You might be hungry for it yourself. If you've offered face-to-face -face seminars or other events in the past, now is the time to start planning to revive them and if you haven't done them in the past, now's the time to consider uh, planning for them. Start planning for this fall. But here's the key. Now that so many people are more comfortable with online, you can blend the best of both worlds. 
Face to face, of course, gives you a level of intimacy and human to human interaction that just isn't the same online, no matter what the most avid e-learning evangelists say. But online learning can be much better for, for example, reaching larger numbers of people with a consistent experience. And at the same time, it can be much more targeted to specific learner needs, and it's a lot more trackable than face-to-face -face often is. So aim to leverage online and face-to-face -to, -face to support each other. Use online courses and other digital tools to deliver content that helps people prepare for face-to-face -face or to reinforce what they learn in a face-to-face -face environment. And use face-to-face -face as a way to help your learners connect with you and each other more deeply and then carry those strong relationships back online for a better online experience. Now, if you really apply some time to thinking about it, there are just so many ways you can blend together not just online and offline learning, but also different online formats like self-paced and live online courses. And you can create a mix of high value offerings of different price points that serve different needs within your audience. So take a real look at the possibilities that blending offers in the coming year. Now, in a way, Blending is an approach to helping you get more out of what you already have to offer. And my next point has a similar aim, though it comes from a, a different perspective. And that point is that less is more. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that people don't want to have to sit through hours of online course material to learn everything about whatever topic it is that you teach. They want the minimum effective dose to address whatever problem or opportunity they are facing at that point in time. Now, there are at least two major trends that make me think this. The first is that we're coming off of a year of people overdosing on digital communication. You know, in the wake of Zoom fatigue and Netflix binging, I think we're bound to see a bit of a backlash and a, and a rise in digital minimal, minimalism, if I can even say that word, digital minimalism. Probably more importantly though, two of the biggest buzzwords in online learning for the past several years have been A, microlearning, talking about very small learning, and personalized learning. And these are all about keeping things short, focused, to the point for the individual learner. And as platforms have gotten better and as artificial intelligence has improved, these two trends are becoming a reality. Now, as course producers, it's a good time to be thinking about how we can create shorter, more focused experiences. And that may mean figuring out good ways to break apart larger courses into separate, smaller offerings, ones that can be purchased individually or maybe bundled together for learners who really want to be able to do more. And that kind of flexibility goes back to that shift in expectations that I noted as my first point. Increasingly, people are going to expect that e-learning is available in smaller, more focused doses. And smaller, more focused online learning may be just what you need for the sort of blending I talked about in my second point. Content that can be used to prepare people for face-to-face -face learning or reinforce the experience afterward and keep learners engaged with you. You may even want to consider whether you create or carve out shorter learning experiences that you offer for free as a form of content marketing. And I'm not going to call it out as a separate trend, but effective content marketing is still extremely important. It's just an ongoing part of being in the digital business or in any business, really. So consider ways in which you rethink your content or approach creating it differently to deliver experiences that are still impactful, but that represent a minimum effective dose of learning. Less is more. Now, I just mentioned content marketing. I'm a huge advocate of effective content marketing. I think consistently publishing high quality content that demonstrates your expertise and the value you can provide is really essential for attracting people to you and convincing them that paying for a course with you is worth it. But Content will only get you so far these days. It's just so noisy and, and competitive out there in many markets. There are a lot of online courses. A site like Udemy alone, for example, offers well over 100,000 courses at this point. So even with good content, it's hard to get in front of people and get their attention, much less convert them into buyers. 
most people can't really do it on their own, especially in the, in the early days of their business. Because of that, I think networks uh, for selling is going to be more important than ever in the coming few years. And by network selling, I mean tapping into other people's networks to reach highly qualified prospects for your courses. Now, before I go any further, I need to acknowledge Tom Poland of Leadsology for really opening my eyes to this concept in 2020. You know, leveraging relationships and networks to sell, that's always been important. But Tom has made a real science of it, and he made me realize how important it is in our current context. I highly recommend his book, uh, Marketing with Webinars. In it, he goes much deeper into the whole concept of other people's networks, or OPN as he calls it, and, and gets deeply into that whole approach. But the, the driver for it is that people just have so many choices these days. And you really only have three possibilities, I'd say, for being a choice that they even consider. One is to get in front of them through some sort of mass media or paid advertising, you know, on Facebook, social media, YouTube, that sort of thing. But that can be expensive. And the level of trust is usually pretty low from those forms of outreach. And so as a result, conversion is usually pretty low. Another is to show up at the top of results on uh, search engines or, or maybe on ratings and, and review sites. And I think that's uh, a lot better. Um, it's, it's certainly something to aim for uh, over the longer run, but it can be very competitive and, and labor intensive and it just, it takes time. So it's rarely the best or most direct strategy for businesses looking to grow in the short run. And that brings us back to the third option, the, the focus of my point here, which is network selling. And this is all about forming relationships with other people who have audiences that align with or even overlap with uh, your audience and then developing concrete ways to market to each other's audiences. And usually the most productive way to do this, and, and this is especially true for anyone offering courses or any sort of expertise-based services, is through webinars. Um, and webinars in which you share valuable knowledge and skills with their audiences and vice versa. And obviously you do that with a, a call to action woven in that paves a path to participating in your courses. Now in some cases you may do this on uh, an affiliate or a revenue share basis to generate some income. But personally, I think that's secondary. The main thing is to build a network of relationships that gets you in front of people that you wouldn't reach otherwise. And better yet, uh, get them in front, of, get in front of them in a way in which you have a warm introduction to them through your contact. And you should be prepared to do the same in return, uh, of course. Uh, and you don't actually have to have a large audience to do this. Many people worry about that, but you just simply need a high quality audience, uh, an audience that a, that a partner is going to care about and a group of potential collaborators who share the goals uh, that, that you share, goals similar to yours. Now, if I can recommend one thing to focus on in 2021, it's really growing this kind of network. I think it's so important. And again, Tom Poland's book is a great resource. Now, one of the great things about network selling is that it introduces you to new audiences of buyers, and some of those potential audiences are bound to be businesses. And that leads me to my next point, that businesses will buy. I think selling to businesses is one of the biggest untapped opportunities for most course creators. We all tend to be focused on that individual learner who's going to you know, pull out her credit card and, and purchase an enrollment and, and engage with us. But you know, let's, let's face it, outside of pulling off big launches, which can be very labor intensive um, and often don't produce the kind of results that we hope for, outside of that, selling to individuals means building your business single sale by single sale. Now, on the other hand, if you can manage to sell your course to a business buyer, you may sell tens or hundreds or even thousands of seats at once. And that's a much faster path to positive cash flow and to growth for your business. Of course, you can't just say, okay, I'm going to sell to, to businesses now and, and have that magically happen. You're probably going to have to rethink in a number of areas. So selling to businesses may mean modifying your content somewhat uh, or figuring out ways to, to supplement and enhance your current content to make it better fit business needs. 
Uh, it's definitely going to mean selling to a different type of buyer, one who has different goals and decision-making criteria than your usual individual student is going to have. And that's going to mean that you need to communicate your value differently as well to ensure that your value proposition resonates with whoever is actually making the buying decisions in a business, and that's usually not the, the learner, the person who's actually going to be your student. It also means that you need a platform that can support selling to businesses. And that may mean uh, that the platform allows for businesses to access a part of it that's carved out just for that business and for its learners. Uh, or it might mean that the platform supports you creating courses with authoring tools that conform to e-learning standards, uh, meaning that it will be possible for a business to use your courses on its own learning management system. And, Many platforms don't really support that. You have to build the courses inside the platform, and then it's hard to get them to any place else. Learn Worlds is a platform that supports, for example, SCORM, the Shareable Content Object Reference Model, which really is the, the key e-learning standard for portability of courses. So you can build your courses in a SCORM-based tool, and that's going to make it possible not only to offer them in Learn Worlds, but if you need to put them into another platform for your business buyers, that's going to be possible. And these are all points to think through as you plan your course creation efforts going forward. Most course creators have a business audience for their content, but you have to do the work to ensure that you find those business buyers and that those business buyers are going to want to buy what you have to offer. So I've got just a couple more points to make, and this next one actually picks up on the talk that I did at Worlds of Learning in 2020. And that talk was on how to build a learning community. And I'll tell you, I'm more convinced than ever that uh, community really is the key to thriving over the long term and really maximizing your potential as a course creator. And the logic behind that is, is pretty simple. A single course is just that. You get someone to buy once and go through a single learning experience with you. And, even if you have a good email list and are able to stay in touch and sell that learner additional courses, you've probably not created or delivered anywhere near the value that you could in that relationship. And of course, that's just a single learner. You know, No matter how good you do with one, you still got a bunch more that you're trying to uh, connect with and, and serve. So all of that is, is pretty transactional. It's again, those selling courses one by one, seat by seat, interacting learner by learner. When you build a community, you move beyond those individual transactions and into building relationships. Relationships with your learners, uh, between your learners and you, and relationships between your learners and each other. You develop much more of an emotional connection. And there are a number of reasons that this is just really valuable. For one, it helps you to, to differentiate and stand out in the market. When you have not just a course, but also a community where people get ongoing access to you and to peers, that's just much higher value than, than most of your competition is likely to be able to offer. It also supports how people tend to learn today. And this goes back to the point about less is more. People often don't want or need a course. They just have a particular question or a challenge on which they need input. And being able to dip in and out of a community fits well with the whole idea of learning in the flow of work. Uh, which is another big buzz term in, in the world of learning right now. Communities also provide a way for people to revisit and re-engage with ideas over time, which we know is just a much more effective approach to learning than a single course experience. And as I already mentioned, a community gives you a way to stay in touch with your learner in, in a meaningful way, and that makes it much easier to sell future offerings to them it also provides a powerful way to get input on what those offerings should be. You can get that kind of feedback from your community. And finally, and this is kind of the, the sum of all the parts that I've just mentioned, when you create community, you create a huge asset for your business, one that's self-perpetuating to a large degree. It has immediate value for your business, and if you ever decide to, to sell, it can also dramatically increase the price you're able to get for your business if you have that established community. Now, we don't have time in this session to dive into the ins and outs of creating a community, but like I said, I've spoken about this before, and uh, you can find that talk uh, as well as the transcript at the, the link on the screen now, and that will also be part of the resources I post at learningrevolution.net slash learnworlds slash resources. Now, finally, 
I want to talk about data. I've mentioned a few of the buzzwords in the world of learning, things like uh, microlearning and personalization and learning in the flow of work. Data is a buzzword that, that tra transcends the world of learning. You hear about it everywhere. But it does have some specific applications and implications in the world of learning. And I think the most successful course creators going forward are going to be able to take those applications and implications to heart. And my view is that data really is direction. What I mean by that is that data about our learners is, is really the most reliable tool we have for figuring out the right learning experiences to create, to make sure those learning experiences are successful, and to mapping out the future path for our education businesses. You know, if we aren't paying attention to the data, then we're really just flying blind and depending purely on instinct and luck, and eventually those are just bound to fail you. Of course, you have to have access to, to data to actually be able to, to use it. So if you're shopping for a new online course platform, look for one that captures meaningful data about your learner's behavior. Uh, that includes things like buyer behavior, uh, what courses do they look at in your catalog, which ones actually convert the best. It includes learning behavior, you know, how much time do they spend in a course, how well do they do on assessments, are they contributing to discussions, uh, do follow-up surveys show that learners are actually applying what they learn. So make sure the reporting in the platform will actually allow you to, to access that kind of information and be able to show it to you. And, and I'll give you know, props to, to Learn Worlds again as a platform. I think they do a, a very good job with actually capturing data, uh, allowing you to track it and report on it. Now, the exact same thing goes for other tools uh, you use. So, you know, your email platform, uh, your social media tools, you want to make sure that those are capturing meaningful data and that they have good reporting, that you can actually see what's happening in those tools. And if you don't have Google Analytics hooked up and, and know how to get relevant data from it, it's way past time to do that, make that, you know, a, a very high priority. And keep in mind, too, that some of your most valuable data is, is going to be less formal. It's not going to necessarily be, you know, the, the num numbers in a spreadsheet sort of thing. It's things like the, the types of topics that people tend to get excited about in a, in a community. You can just kind of see it and feel it. Or the reactions uh, you get when you, when you pilot an offering, which I always recommend doing before investing in full-blown production. So just in, in general, you know, the days are gone when assuming that just because you have expertise in a subject area that you know what to teach um, and that you know how to go about teaching it in, in, the, in the best way and creating the best product. Rely on data for direction. And so that's it. Uh, a quick recap uh, of what we covered. Here are all seven points that expectations are elevated. People are you know, looking for much more out of e-learning now that they're much more familiar with it. The blended is better, particularly blending uh, online and, and offline and, and taking the best of both worlds and putting them into the experiences you offer. Less is more. People are looking for shorter, more targeted, but still very effective and highly impactful content for their learning. The networks sell. They're really being intentional, really being conscious about partnering with people with similar audiences and sharing those audiences uh, and, and building your, your sales together. The businesses will buy. Big opportunity that so many course creators have yet to really even try to capitalize on, but can uh, send your growth through the roof very quickly. The community is key, that you're really creating an asset in so many ways when you're able to create an ongoing community with your learners. And then finally, the data is direction. Really getting the data and taking the data seriously for how you continue to develop and grow your business. Now, the final point I'll make is that action is everything. If you don't take action on these points, then they don't really matter. Now, that's pretty obvious, uh, but there's always a big enough gap between knowing and doing that that's always worth saying. So to help you take action and move from knowing to doing, again, I've gathered various resources together. Again, you can find those at learningrevolution.net slash learnworlds slash resources. So be sure to, to check those out. Don't hesitate to drop me a line with any questions or comments. You can just send that to jcobb at learningrevolution.net. Many thanks, and I wish you great success as you navigate the e-learning landscape in 2021 and on out into the future.